What's the first game that comes to your mind when you hear the phrase post-apocalyptic? For me, it's the Mitchell series. I remember my first time playing it on the Xbox at my best friend's house years ago, and it blew me away. The aesthetic, the characters, and the gameplay created such a unique experience. Almost 10 years and hundreds of games later, Metro 2033 still holds a special place in my heart. But now that I'm able to look at media from a more critical viewpoint, I wonder if the game is still as good as I remember. So join me on this epic adventure into the burned down ruins of Moscow to find out. But before we begin, thank you for watching. Released in 2010, Metro was developed by 4A Games, a Ukrainian studio. The game drops us right into the middle of action by having us climb to the surface before we could find out where we are and why. A pack of beasts was waiting for us. Mm -hmm. Seems like nobody's home. Dealing with them and regroup with our team, we got attacked by an even bigger pack. Did you hear that? Listen. Watch your best, boys. The intro ends with a winged beast called a demon knocking us out. After the intro, the game goes back to 8 days ago where our journey started. Our protagonist, Artyom, is a resident of the exhibition station in the Metro system. If you haven't read the novel, the premise is similar to the Fallout franchise. In 2013, the Third World War started with an exchange of nuclear attacks. Most of Russia, especially Moscow, was wiped out in an instant. About 30,000 people took shelter in the underground metro system during the bombing and were subsequently trapped in there. In the 20 years leading up to the events in the game, the survivors have made the underground stations their home. The place where our protagonist stays at, Exhibition, is one of them. And recently, the station has come under attack by an unknown enemy, the Dark Ones. The station can't survive much longer if these attacks don't stop. We must do something. <sighs> what more can we do? The Dark Ones will kill us all. As we make our way through the station, we can see the devastation of the Dark Ones' attacks. Some were severely injured, while others lost their mind, slowly dying of insanity. Meeting up with Hunter, a ranger and a good friend of the family, our meeting was cut short by a monster attack. Damn, they never come this far into this station. It's the hospital. They smell the blood. I forgot to mention, but the radiation in Moscow is so concentrated it caused heavy mutation in the local wildlife. Look at this beast. Doesn't it look like a mole rat on steroid? In the game it's called a Nosalis, dwelling mostly in the tunnels underground. Are you alright? Of course. He's a dead eye shot, this one. After fending off the initial attack, we find out that the guard post was destroyed. The Dark Ones! They destroyed the outer guard post! Most of them are dead, save for one single survivor. Hunter decides to investigate this threat after giving us a mission. I must go recon the situation. Listen carefully, Atim. If I'm not back here by morning, you must get to police station and find a man named Miller. Tell him what's happened to me. Stirring in the northern tunnels. Show this to Miller so he knows I've sent you. I trust everything to you, Artyom. Don't let me down. If we are to survive, this threat must be eliminated, no matter the cost. Eliminated. Understand? Our worst fear was confirmed. Hunter did not return. It's up to us now to inform Colonel Miller at police about the situation here. Back in the 2000s when technology was more limited, the majority of games would take place across multiple levels. Metro is not an exception. Being an action game with very light role-playing element doesn't allow much room for side quests or subplots. The main story has to do all the heavy lifting. A linear game certainly has its limits. 
So we gear up and set out to Polis. Hello, Artyom. You need some weapons? Submachine gun, 5.45 caliber, made in the armory. It's got poor accuracy and overheats like hell. That's why they call it a bastard gun. Here's a universal charger to keep the battery powered. And a gas mask. Put it on if you cross any radiation hot zones. Or, God help you, go up to the surface. Army issue first aid kits, just in case. Our first stop, Riga. Привет. So you're ready to move out? Are you ready? Well, let's go then. Artyomka! Free at last, huh? Well, for as long as the ride takes, anyway. Should be fun. More dangerous. Even better, right? But of course, the tunnels are never safe. Our caravan got knocked out by something. My head! And we were the first to wake up. Finally, we make it to Riga after barely escaped the horde of Nosales. That was hot. I need a drink. Looking at the fight, Metro is not the smoothest shooter game. The weapons have a certain degree of sway, recoil is hard to manage, and sometimes the guns get jam. If I play on Ranger Hardcore, I even have to count bullets like in real life. But keep in mind, the nuclear fallout of Moscow took place only 20 years ago. Over the years, people managed to recover whatever old weaponry left intact. But the fact that there are still functioning firearms is already a miracle. And our protagonist, Artyom, just turned 20. He practically grew up underground, is malnourished and untrained in handling guns. Not having his shoulder dislocated by the double barrel is another miracle from the heavens. Each time a weapon is fired, we can feel its force. This is only enhanced by the crisp sound design and smooth animation. When Artyom wears his gas mask, the vision will blur around the edge and we can hear his constant breathing. When the filter is almost used up, the alarm will go off and the breathing turns into gasping. The flashlight needs to be recharged. When we go near a radioactive zone, the Geiger counter will start going off. When I play the game, a part of me truly believes I'm right there in the ruins of Moscow trying to survive. All these little details are harmonized by the gameplay, creating such an immersive experience. Arriving at Riga, we find out that the station is currently under lockdown for some reasons. Let me out of the station! Hey, what the hell do you care if I live or die? I don't care, asshole. But I got my orders. Luckily, someone heard about our immunity to the tunnels and need a companion for their trip. This is Bourbon. I need to get to Dry Station for some business, but this rat hole is on lockdown. Even now I'm still not sure what he did to be so infamous. I guess he's a scammer from all the money he owes people. But you know what a real scam looks like? Hey baby, you like what you see? That right there. Off to Dry Station we go. Shit, caravanners. They're all dead, I know that style. Bandits. And Hansa boasted that they'd wipe them out. Ah, ah, now keep your eyes peeled. They won't let us pass freely. Oh yeah, I also forgot. You can play this game like a stealth game, and I'm a sucker for those. What the? Some kind of a noise. Outside of market, another pack of Nosalis ambushes us. Don't let your two-legged brethren die a foolish death! Artyom, hang on! Fate's on our side! Reloading! 
but thanks to the machine gun fire that's aimed directly at us, we survived. At the market, Bourbon was able to secure a deal with the sentries for them to let us to the surface. Well, I made an arrangement with the guy here. Take my spare filter. We need to get up to the surface. And get out. I've already paid, Mike. Shit. A pleasure doing business with you. Alright, alright. Just get it. Yeah, I think Bourbon is either a smuggler or a scammer, or both. This is Moscow. So that's the dead city. Welcome home, Artyom. Once the home of millions of people, now it's a barren desert for humans. But nature finds a way to live on, as life is teeming in this place. It's just that life here is hostile towards humans. And they're huge. Hi, kid. Stay here and if we meet the beast in the open, crawl into the nearest crevice. Here in the Dead City, as the people underground would call it, we get to see the Dark Ones up close. On our journey, we have seen glimpses of them being neutral to us, but here they talk to us directly with no hostility at all. Which is weird, since they were the ones that got so many people in the metro killed by the monsters. But we don't have time to think too much about it, not when that thing's chasing us. While exploring, we sometimes get this weird sound cue and the screen flashes white for a bit. That's the game telling us that we just collected a karma point, reaching a certain threshold of these points and we can get the good ending. Like many games of the time, Metro tried to implement a moral system to the gameplay. The idea behind it was that the ending should not be decided by a decision right at the end, but an accumulation of our actions throughout the game. Like time travel, it sounds interesting, but very hard to be done right. The most prominent criticism of this feature is that these moral points are almost arbitrary. Finding them feels more like hunting collectibles rather than making meaningful decisions that could impact the story. I agree. I don't see how finding hidden rooms from other stalkers can add to my good boy points. But I think they also have their benefits. Each time I stumble on a cache of a stalker or their corpses, I feel like I've only seen the end of a story. It makes me wonder what kind of a person this corpse was and what led them here. The system encourages exploration and also enables environmental storytelling. Narrowly escaping the talons of the demons, we in Bourbon found ourselves in a station controlled by bandits. These bastards are like roaches, even nuclear hellfire can't get rid of them. Bourbon told us that he has friends here and we might be granted safe passage. It's Bourbon the Huckster. Look who's talking. Take me to your boss. I have business with him. The boss? But of course. Then who the boss it is. Where else would you like to go, huh? Okay, that's enough. Or else we'll have to drag him. Move it. We'll finish this later. Well, so much for that. Now we need to find Bourbon and escape from here. This level is a test to our game knowledge. These bandits are smart, so they rig the whole place with tripwires. The patrols are very tight, so if you are not careful, the whole station will be alerted. Like this. Once a gunfight breaks out, we must use the shadow to our advantage.
The little lamp on our watch is sensitive to light, so if it close, we're visible. We can exchange gunfire. Set up an ambush around the corner and catch the bandits off guard. A cool thing in this game is that we can see the enemy's light from the headlamp and the laser around the corner. This makes pre-firing them much easier. Once the numbers are more even, we can start advancing towards them. After clearing the whole station, we rush into the boss room where Bourbon is being interrogated. What did you bring with you, bastard? Answer, suka, or I will shut you up! What? Who is it? Who is it? One night! They struggle for the gun, and Bourbon and the bandit leader killed each other. Just then, a man jumps down from the ceiling and invites us to join him. You can keep your weapon down. Young man. His name is Khan, and we're heading to the Cursed Station. I'm going back to Cursed. This station's humidity is making me rheumatic. If you'd rather share your friend's fate, then by all means, stay. If the destination is called Cursed, you can guess what the road leading there looks like. Nobody ever walks here. <coughs> Neither people nor beasts. Even the rats are absent. Khan brought us along a haunted tunnel. Here we get to see a more supernatural side of the metro. They know we are here. Come closer to the tubes and listen. Just... <coughs> Some say it's the voice of the tunnels. Others consider it to be a form of psychic influence. From lingering echoes of people and events of the past to anomaly that's capable of wiping out all life in its vicinity. I recommend to never go here. 0 out of 10. Get me out. On a serious note, Khan gives us some interesting perspective while traveling. Heaven, hell, and purgatory were atomized as well. So when a soul leaves the body, it has nowhere to go and must remain here, in the metro. A harsh but not undeserved atonement for our sins, wouldn't you agree? The human race as a collective have destroyed ourselves with our own weapons. As far as we know, there aren't anyone left but the metro. Life goes on, but we're falling behind in the survival race. The future seems bleak, like the end of this caved-in tunnel. But despite this, we struggle on anyway. Doesn't matter if the odds are against us, as long as there is hope, we will live on. And hope has arrived for Cursed Station. When we get there, the station is under another Nosalis attack. Let's go, lad. The defenders could use some help. Our task is to collapse the tunnel leading outside and an air shaft. Try luring the monsters towards us if there are too many. If anything, this chapter should be called Legging It, cause that's what I'm about to do. There's no point shooting the beasts, they spawn indefinitely. We need to run up the stair, rig the beam with explosive, then hang all the way right to get the bomb. Now back to the middle and all the way left to the end of the tunnel. Now we set the bomb. Since we're invulnerable during a cutscene, the monsters are just moaning into my ears. And with that, we buy Cursed Station a few more precious days.
We and Khan say our goodbye as we need to head to Polis. I won't be going further with you. I'm still needed here. The tunnels have collapsed. If you still want to get to Polis, you'll have to take a detour. You can get to the armory from here, and afterwards you will have to go through the stations belonging to the Reds and the Nazis. Yes, you heard it right. There are communists and fascists down here in the metro. Because when we nuke ourselves into the Ice Age and barely survive the aftermath, the only correct course of action is political extremism. Truly a humanity moment. Even a nuclear hellfire couldn't burn away our bad habits. The armory is the free station, or at least was. Careful kid. Our free station is under the watchful eye of the Reds. Paranoia is a new game in town, so keep yourself below the radar. You understand? Face to the wall, this is an inspection. And who are you? Put your hands out! You're under arrest. I'll come quietly. There! Stop you, punk! Through yet another miracle, we escape the communists. Andrew the blacksmith smuggles us on a trolley to the front line because we need to cross it to reach Polis. It's okay guys, he's with us. Arjun, you see that luggage hold? Get into it. In any case, we can sneak past them by sticking to the ground. And we weren't the only one thinking of this, since someone has rigged the path with explosives. Ouch. Making short work of the Nazis and we got captured. Good point. Alright, Red Scout. Offer a prayer to your march. But before we're sent to meet the Maker, two Rangers save us. Hey, maybe if you big, you'll think about killing you quickly. <laughs> Recognizing Hunter's dog tag, the Ranger Pavel accompanies us back to Polis. We just have to fight our way through an entire Nazi-controlled zone. And these bastards have tanks! Eventually, we would lose the enemies, only for the mutants to show up. This is the train depot, and the Nosales have made it their home. Our companion, Pavel, sacrifices himself. It is up to us now to head to Black Station to meet with Ullman. We run into a station's last stand against the beast. The passage to the station is closed off until the evacuation is complete. Prepare for battle. Take whatever spare ammo is left in the stash. You're one of us now. The fight was bloody, no one from the station made it. The captain hands us a message, we must relay it to Polis. Go up to our radio beacon. Contact Polis. But to get there, we must go through a fascist outpost. Oh! On this difficulty, it's a challenge to play it like a stealth game. 
Finally, we made it to Black Station. Surrender and you won't get hurt. I swear! Indeed, this can get very ugly if you go in gun blazing, so let's take it slow. It was the What a maze that was. Now we can get to Polis in peace. We'll reach Polis soon. At the beginning of each mission, we get a short monologue about the location or events in it. Scattered around the levels are diary pages that also allow us a peek into what Artyom thinks and feels. We can view those pages as a representation of a spontaneous thought he has during those moments. This will be an unpopular opinion, but I don't find Artyom being a mute protagonist that important. Him being mute allows us to answer the dialogues ourselves, adding another layer of immersion, or at least that's a thought. A linear first-person shooter in the 2000s and only have space for so much dialogues. I can see why people dislike this choice, many moments can feel like a missed high five because Artyom wouldn't answer the NPC once. But I've found myself more often than not blurting out answers and comments toward the in-game dialogues. Moments like that make me feel very connected to the character of Artyom. In a way, he's like the perfect self-insert. Arriving at Polis, we get to meet with the leadership immediately. Artyom, I'm Mina. What is the message from her? Sailing! This way. Just like mandatory, bureaucracy is another unkillable habit. The committee at Polis denies our plea for help. After all, none of them has to face the mutants themselves, and losing a station far enough is not really a big concern for them. Unbelievable, Artyom. I'm stunned that the council has refused to help your station. I I'm ashamed that they lack the courage you have already shown. But Miller has another idea. The rangers have found several well-preserved missile bases near the city. Some could probably be activated and deliver a missile strike against the Dark Ones. We could activate the dormant missiles in Moscow from Bunker D6 to bomb the Dark Ones. As if the ruined city above us is not enough, but I appreciate the thought. In Metro lore, D6 is this mythical military bunker hidden deep underground in Moscow. Our mission now is to plunder the Moscow library for a map of the metro system, as D6 is rumored to be connected to it. These are not Nocellas, they're called Watchmen. My guess is that they're mutated dogs or wolves. They move in packs, and unless we can funnel them into a choke point, they will run us over. The side of the library is an excellent position for this, as the beast can only attack us from one side. After meeting up with Miller and heading deeper into the library, one member of our group got severely injured. So we are alone again. This level is probably the most terrifying one throughout the entire game. If we play it right, there's no need to fire a single bullet. But for that, we must be very good at keeping the librarian at bay. These are mutated apes and somehow they won't attack us if we stare at them in the eyes. But if they get close enough, they'll just squish us, and we need a lot of resources just to kill one of them. This playstyle doesn't allow us to move very fast, and we must constantly look over our shoulder. Otherwise, this happens. <laughs> 
After tiptoeing through the underground complex, finally we come across the map to D6. Now we need to get back to Miller. After a short rest at the Spartans based church, it's time to find D6. According to the map, there are several ways of reaching D6. Now the closest one is through the facilities near Kipska. Okay, we try that route. The deeper we head down there, the more dangerous the way is. To reach D6, we must reach an automatic station. Unlucky for us, we got separated with the group. If you have arachnophobia, this will be highly uncomfortable. I suggest skipping to here. Now if you're ready for some goosebumps, enjoy! Reuniting with the group, an automatic train arrives to pick us up. Thank god, at least you are alive. D6 is in reach now. The base is really deep underground and filled with toxic gas for being left alone for so long. There are no enemies here, the whole bunker feels dead. Our first task is to start up the four generators for the ventilation system. But this is not enough for the whole base, we need to activate the main power grid. Backup depleted. What about main power? Well, it looks like the reactor is deactivated. My guess is that they use nuclear power to run this place. Because what on earth could this be? <sighs> this is like a form of cancer that somehow found a way to grow on concrete. And guess what, when we head down to the bottom to restart the main generator, it spits acid balls at us. <laughs> Finally we're done with this bunker. In the meantime, Ullman finds a targeting laser for the rocket system. Our final destination is the big tower from the beginning. While exploring D6, we could see things like pristine pre-war tanks, anti-air vehicles, rockets, weapons a nation would boast about. And while looking at them, Colonel Miller makes some comment about the whole thing. Yes, with sword and fire, we'll win back the sky and the sun. We climb out of the dirt. Rebuild the cities. The metro tunnels will once again be filled with fast silver trains, everything. He refers to this as power, and with this power, we could win back the surface. Quite ironic since it's this sort of weapons that sent us down here in the first place. Or the communists and the fascists. They think they can seize power and establish dominance over the metro, creating their utopia in the process. The thing that seems like a solution to our struggle is the reason we're struggling to begin with. If hope is what keeps the metro alive, then human stubbornness to learn from our mistakes is what's going to put an end to it. While other characters are swept away in their own fight, Khan acts like the voice of reason to our protagonist. He reminds us that to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past, we must think beyond the binary of good and evil, survival and death. In this new world, the old standards don't work anymore. This is a very roundabout way to say that we should consider before we blast the Dark Ones into oblivion like we did ourselves 20 years ago. And he's got a point, so far the Dark Ones have only helped us, and we're about to nuke them. The missiles are ready. All we need to do is to get onto the tower, mount the device, and boom it goes. The trip up there is the stressful part. Come on! Come on! And I have to admit, my hands sweat a lot during this. I don't like heights in real life and some of it carries over to gaming. Once we're at the top, the Dark Ones are now fully aware of our intention to bomb them. He brings, he brings death. They would put us in an illusion to get us to fall off the tower. We have to navigate this labyrinth, avoid the Dark Ones and the gaps. In the end, Hunter shows up with a gun and gives us this iconic line. If it's hostile, you kill it. 
Here's where the moral system comes to fruition. If we have accumulated enough brownie points, which we had, we get to wake up 20 seconds before the launch. Shooting the targeting device will ensure the good ending, while letting it go off gives us the canon ending. I'm a good ending enjoyer, so let's go with that. I feel like that ending puts a nice tie to the story of Metro 2033. We've seen people try their best to survive or to kill each other again. We keep going in circle, doing the same thing hoping the outcome would be different. So to break free from this cycle of violence, we choose to spare the Dark Ones and bury the hatchet. There will be much time before humans and this new species of mutant can coexist, but this is a small step towards building a better future for all of us. And with that, we have reached the end of our journey. Despite the underwhelming moral system, Metro 2033 was near perfect. The story is well written, environment is memorable, and combat is just so immersive. The game is one of the best post-apocalyptic survival game ever, even for today's standard. Years later, and Metro is still as good as I remember. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching again. Have a good day, and bye!